I, I'd just like to begin by saying I think, you know, uh, Janet actually really encapsulated in her seven minutes, you know, CFTR modulation, some of the bittersweet uh, aspects of it, the benefits, the pitfalls, the highs, the lows, um, and obviously ultimately the struggle. And, uh, and in essence, I think it's, it's a classic uh, um, uh, case in one way that what you do at a meeting is you have a speaker who says something succinctly for seven minutes, and then you get an Irish person to go up and repeat it all for about 45 minutes. So, <laughs> so I apologise that in some respects uh, that uh, that this is this is the case. But what I will try to do is 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 is, is show where we have commonality, uh, because I think it's very important. And I'd just genuinely like to thank Janet for sharing that, because I think this is what it's all about, uh, Janet and Dave and patients with cystic fibrosis. So the journey. It kind of started with Dorothy Anderson when, you know, in the 30s, she described this as a pancreatic condition. Um, by the late 80s, early 90s, we knew the, the gene for cystic fibrosis, and um, Francis Collins and co identified that. At that time, there was a, a boy on the front cover of Science who had cystic fibrosis. And 20 years later, in 2009, in, in Nature Medicine, that same boy had grown up and was holding the journal. But what was important was in the 20 years, there was no real CFTR modulation. And so we shouldn't forget that either in our journey, that the doing certain things well pre-CFTR modulation is critical. That said, in those 20 years, we learned an awful lot about the gene. We realized that there was almost 2,000 mutations. And perhaps wh wh what was most important for where we're going to go in the next 45 minutes or so was that we were able to classify the gene based on these defects. And ultimately, we were able to break it down into what are uh, six different classification systems around how much CFTR protein you produce, uh, where you produce it, where it gets to, does it open or close, etc. And based on this, as you can see, and these types of mutation, you can then, in a world of potentially personalized medicine, target the individual uh, mutations with individual or combinations of therapy. And so this is essentially the concept behind CFTR modulation. In truth, uh, the, the big breakthrough and the first breakthrough was in the area of the gating mutations and specifically patients on Ivacaftor with the G551D mutation. However, we now know that there is uh, data uh, for uh, people with Delta 508 mutations and R117H mutations as well uh, that, has, that has hit the press, been published, and is currently evolving its way into the clinical arena. Uh, um, and so, in short, if we look at the journey, what we can see in relation to CFTR modulation is, is there's a lot on CFTR potentiators, there's emerging uh, strong data on CFTR correctors, there's stuff on read-through agents that, that's been published, and also the one-shoe-fits-all gene therapy data, uh, where it doesn't matter what your mutation is, can you CFTR modulate it or not? And so what I'm going to try to do is take you through uh, a lot of this over the coming uh, period of time. That said, most of the data and most of what we know, and if we are to understand mechanism, which is ultimately what we want to do, because you don't just want to drive a car, you want to be able to fix a car too when it breaks down, and the same thing should apply in cystic fibrosis, then we need to focus on CFTR potentiators uh, for the start. Because we do need a benchmark. We do need, when we look at understanding CFTR modulation, to know how good something can be. Now, some of you who know me personally know that I obsess about rock music. And, and, and in truth, if you want to know how good a Fender Strat is, you get Jimi Hendrix to play it. If you want to know how good a Les Paul is, you get uh, Jimmy Page to play it. 
And, and this is the point about why we have to study either CAFTA and G551D, because that really is the game changer, and that's where we're, we're going, and it's where we're trying to go with everything that's going to follow afterwards. Will we get there or not? That will be the challenge. And so I'm going to first of all talk about uh, either CAFTA and G551D, and I'm going to look at clinical trial data first of all. Then I'm going to say that there's a problem with clinical trials because they don't translate for the individual. In fact, they often exclude a lot of people who would like to be on the drug, and so we have to extrapolate for those. And equally, Clinical trials don't tell us what happens when you leave Team CF or Team Trial and you're back in the real world with your medication. And so what does that mean for the patients? And we need to study that. And then finally, I think cases. You know, I, Barack Obama always talks about the power of one. And I mean, in truth, there's a lot to be said for those single observations um, because they can tell us a lot if we keep sharing these. And so I'm going to share some of those with you. So we've all seen slides like this before. This is the, the Fred van der Gore work that basically shows that Ivacaftor increases the probability that your CFTR protein will work. Uh, um, and as a consequence, and on the back of all of that, there was the seminal Strive and Envision studies, which looked at this drug in patients with G551D. Now, what did it tell us? It told us something fantastic. It told us that CFTR modulation can improve lung function by over 10%. It can decrease exacerbation rates significantly. Weight can go up by four kilos. Your CF quality of life in a lung domain can go up by uh, almost eight points, which is twice what people regard as clinically significant. And your sweat chloride goes down, so you had a biomarker. And so this was, in in many respects, the home run. It was, it was, it was seminal uh, when it came out. Persist, which was the follow-on, showed that in a clinical trial setting, the, the effects are sustained. So again, part of a clinical trial, you have a sustained response. And as a consequence of this, you can see that in different jurisdictions, the drug has been available for quite a while. In the US, I think the longest. Uh, in Ireland, we've been getting reimbursement and using this drug routinely since for two and a half years now. I understand that in Australia, we're coming up to a probably about a one year time point uh, of the drug being routinely used. Um, and as a consequence of all these different studies, it's available for gating mutations. So the problem with clinical trials um, and the problem with loading your slides up, because I'd actually deliberately hidden this slide, but it's managed to reappear, is, is um, I, I hope some of the other slides I've hidden are actually definitely hidden. Um, but um, the problem with them uh, is, is that they, they don't represent necessarily real world. So multi-center real world data, the, the first study would be the GOAL study. And this is our, our, our US colleagues. And this is a very important study. It followed the patients as they rolled out into the real world. It was 151 patients from approximately 29 sites, I think it was. And it showed some interesting findings. First of all, it showed that the lung function went up, but it didn't go up uh, to the same level as was seen in the clinical trial. Uh, but what was an interesting finding, and again, Pradeep Singh spoke about this earlier today, was the pseudomonas signal. And so the issue around could Ivacaftor be anti-pseudomonal certainly came up uh, as a positive. Otherwise, things were fairly similar. They also looked at sputum samples. But we shouldn't draw too many conclusions because their, their, their sputum cytokine data, whilst not positive, uh, was a limited uh, uh, number of sputum sample, uh, samples from a number of different sites. And so there'd be a variability here. But certainly, they didn't see a significant anti-inflammatory response there. Um, they did, and I think this is very important, highlight some GI issues, a restoration in gastric pH, and so maybe that's part of the mechanism in which this, this works. Um, 
and, uh, and they continue to release data around these themes, which is uh, very important data. And they're obliged to do it, I think, because in essence the prevalence here is 4.4% and similarly up to 7.4% in Australia. You need multi-centre studies to correlate this kind of data. But in fact, we're kind of in a, in a slightly unique position in Ireland because 12% of our population have it. And oddly enough, in, in Cork, we're even in a more unique position because 23% carry the G551D mutation. And so, as a consequence of this, we actually have 55 patients on our campus who carry G551D. And to put that in context, that means we have more patients with the G551D mutation than France. And this is important because we have a crutch match in the World Cup against France in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> and we are better. Um, and and so, 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 so this, this is important because we can actually give some single centre data to complement goal uh, around this. And we've basically looked at 33 of our patients um, uh, before and every three months after to try and understand some mechanisms. Now the first point is, is, is that our cohort are responders and they're very like the STRIVE data. Our group go up by about 10% and stay up and everything else is fairly similar. We've seen though an improvement in shuttle tests of 120 metres and we've seen the sustained CFQR results that you saw in STRIVE and in Vision. So in real world responders what happens mechanistically? Well, first of all, we see a decrease in IV antibiotic usage, which is a 76% reduction over 12 months in the real world. This is meaningful. And then we were trying to get a mechanism behind this. And so in relation to this mechanism, we have a low-dose high-res CT protocol. And in essence, it exposes you to the same radiation as you'll get on a transatlantic flight, N nothing close to the radiation you get coming to Australia. Um, and, and basically, just to run through it, we score these CT scans. So we have them at time zero, three, six, nine, and 12 months. And what you can see here is, is that the total ballast score improves. But when we look at why the CT gets better, it's all around peribronchial thickening, and it's all around mucus and consolidation. So we don't reverse bronchiectasis. We enhance mucociliary clearance. At least that's our theory. And this is very much in keeping with what Pradeep was saying earlier. And just to show you some examples, this is before and after. And you can see that the mucus plugging is less, the ground glass is less. This is a more severe disease, a consolidation in the right upper lobe, which is now gone. Again, improved mucus plugging. And then, you know, Ivacaftor is good, but it's not that good there's still going to be areas that don't get better, uh, uh, um, and that's important. Uh, when we looked at our cytokines, we saw a, 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 a reduction in the inflammatory cytokines uh, post Ivacaftor, um, and we're currently ongoing with our microbiome data, but what I would say around that is at later time points, Pradeep talked about day seven, but we're looking at three, six, nine, and 12 months. We don't see the pseudomonas signal the same as everybody else. Uh, uh, when I say everybody else, uh, the same as Strive, or Pradeep for that matter, when he went out uh, further. So I think the jury's out on pseudomonas uh, in relation to being part of the mechanism. Uh, we personally are buying into the idea that Ivacaftor enhances mucociliary clearance. Um, just some practical points, again, like Pradeep, your sweat test doesn't correlate with your response. And people have to remember that when they're, when they're using this uh, around reimbursement. And equally, we didn't see a liver function issue in a real world cohort either. So that's a good safety finding. So we think that the inflammatory and the microbiome changes are downstream effects of improved mucociliary clearance. And we're not alone, because this is work that Preston Campbell uh, kindly uh, gave to us um, to, uh, from Tim Corcoran in the University of Pittsburgh. And so this is basically looking at mucociliary clearance. And this person is the person with G551D. Hold on there now if we can get this thing to work. I think if we click on it, it should, oh no, if we, uh, this is the person before they're on Ivacaptor. And so what you can see here is, is the mucus goes nowhere. It stays in the lung. Okay. On the other hand, if you've got enhanced mucociliary clearance, it should come up, you should swallow it, and it should end up in your stomach. 
And this is the same person three months later. And you can see it clears and goes down into the stomach. It's impressive, isn't it? Okay, so I have a cafter, the road less traveled. And you see, again, the problem here is, is that's great, but what about if I've got severe disease? And also, what about drug-drug interactions? You're in a clinical study, you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that, and if we hear you mention the word grapefruit, we're not going to enroll you. So, so this is the reality that we have to deal with. And then, what about extra-pulmonary issues? And, and finally, I'm going to talk about the power of two. And Barack Obama talks about the power of one. We'll always go one ahead, and, and that's our argument. And, and also talk about things that don't work. So this, this is a case to highlight a, an issue for you. And so this is a gentleman who I know very well. He's a 36-year-old man who attends our service. Doing very well back, in, back a number of years ago, lung function 30 to 35 percent, working away and everything was good. Now, 2011 was a bad year in Ireland, and in my opinion, it was a swine flu year. I can't confirm that, but I certainly think a lot of people think swine flu hit hard in the CF community internationally in 2011. And for reasons that we don't know, he went from being very well to very sick very quickly, and we were scrambling to get him a transplant assessment. Now, he was in hospital continuously on continuous IV antibiotics, but through the name patient program, we were able to get him the drug before um, the drug had been uh, approved. And he started the drug. And what happened to him was really interesting, because two weeks after starting it, he went home. And for the next 20 months, he was admitted once for four days. He still had exacerbations, but they were much milder. But his lung function never improved. But he bridged to transplant. And he was successfully transplanted 20 months later. And, 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 and the key thing was that his inpatient IV antibiotic days were reduced. His lung function never went up. And so you'd ask the question, did it influence severe disease positively, and is it a bridge to transplant? And if you ask him this, he'll say, of course it is, I'm the proof. But we thought we should look at this, and so we looked at this in, uh, because when we look at Bonnie Ramsey, and we're very fond of Bonnie Ramsey because she's done huge things for CF, but she excluded everyone with a lung function of less than 40% in the trial. So we can't say the drug works for these people. And so this was a paper that we did with uh, the Manchester group, Peter Barry, um, she championed this and we were involved in this. And we looked at all the patients between Ireland and the United Kingdom who got the drug on a compassionate use. That's based on the fact that they've got poor lung function and they'd have been excluded from the trials. And what we could see is, is that there was a, an improvement in lung function, an absolute improvement of about 5% in this cohort, relatively 16%, which is huge at that end stage of disease. Um, their weight went up, which is important for transplant, but most importantly, their inpatient median IV antibiotic days went from about 30 a year to zero. So when you're sick, you can be on home IVs. Uh, with severe disease. This is a huge uh, opportunity for patients. Okay, what about drug-drug interactions? Well, this is a family. This is, these are siblings. I know both of them very well. She's 30 and she's female. She's got, you know, good lung function. He's 20, he's her brother, he's male, and he's got worse lung function. Now, it shouldn't be the case. She's female and she's 10 years older and she's got better lung function uh, than him. He's Irish and he's male. Are you surprised? Um, uh, I'm not. But the, the important point here is, is that they both started the drug on the same day. They basically uh, live in the same house, so they eat the same foods. Everything is fairly similar for both of them. And if you look, they both responded pretty much similarly, except that when you look at the doses, he was taking two tablets a week, where she was taking 14 tablets a week. And the reason why was because he had ABPA and he was an itraconazole. And so this is important that we can follow these pe people. Ideally, that we can do drug levels on these people. We used sweats as a way of trying to follow them so that you can work out the optimal dose. Because you can understand, his, his comment to me was, I'm not taking two tablets a week if you're going to give my sister 14. And that's a fairly human response. So we had to show him that he was getting it. And I think it would be great if we could get drug levels. Um, because I think that might help this even further. 
Now, I want to talk about another case, which is where we follow patients and we turn around and we sort of accuse them of not taking their Ivacaftor based on their sweat chloride result. And so this is a 21-year-old guy that we know. He's a really committed college student. And this is what happened when he went to Ivacaftor. His lung function went up, his weight went up, and then at six months he comes back to see us crash. His sweat chloride had taken its appropriate dip, but it had gone back up. So we said to him straight away, hold on a minute, you're not taking your Ivacaftor. And he said, of course I'm taking my Ivacaftor. I said, no, you're not taking your Ivacaftor. Your sweat chloride has gone up. Explain that to us. And he couldn't. But, this, but this, this is the realities. We have to remember, people use sweat chloride in a, in a, in a context of, you know, what's your sweat chloride? Are you taking the drug? And we, we reflected on things, and in truth, he'd gone back to college that week, and it was rag week. And so it's a, re a week where people consume high amounts of alcohol. And in truth, we said to him, okay, go home, and for the next three days, don't consume any alcohol, and come back and repeat your sweat chloride. And what we saw is his sweat chloride had come right back down. And if you talk to patients who do this, and we do, a lot of them will skip an Ivacaftor dose if they're going to a social function with their, with their family and friends that might involve large amounts of alcohol, because they actually do find that there is this kind of reaction that exists. And if you don't want to tell your mother-in-law what you really think about her, you have to factor these things in in the real world. And so this is, imp but this is an important thing when people start using these as ways of determining response. And so again, when we talk about drug-drug interactions, again there's a responsibility for people to think beyond what we regard as orange juice, grapefruit juice, rifampicin. I've put in alcohol. It wasn't put in when, when we talk about the drug in the clinic uh, and through the trials. And so I think it's an important factor to factor into your thinking when you're talking to patients around response or not. And there's mechanisms behind it. What about extra pulmonary disease? And again, Janet pointed out that with the Ivacaftor Lumacaftor, she didn't see any uh, really extra pulmonary benefits. But are there extra pulmonary benefits that can be achieved and certainly are seen in patients with G551D? So this is a patient of ours. And, you know, his lung function was 82%. He'd been on no IV antibiotics. He wasn't going to take Ivacaftor because he felt fine. He was saying, like, what's IV 80% lung function? I'm doing fine. I don't need IVs. Why would I take a drug that's only six months old? There might be a side effect. I'll wait. It's kind of sensible, isn't it? But we said to him, but what about all your GI issues? Maybe it'll make those better. And so he went on the drug, and the first thing you see is, is his lung function went up. So he didn't perceive that because he already had a lung function of 80%, so he could do what he wanted anyway. But it did go up. His sweats went down, his weight went up, but actually his diet changed. He stopped taking Movacol, he could eat whatever he wants, and in fact he describes this as being too good to be true. Um, when we look at his CFQR, and we look beyond the CFQR respiratory domain, because that's all the FDA care about, but as a clinician, I, I care about the patient. I care, care about all systems. What we can see is, is that his eating domain went up, his body image domain went up, his weight domain went up. His respiratory domain didn't change. He didn't perceive a difference, but for him it was about gut health. So we decided to look at this. And we looked at this in our patients, because we're like two years out now. And for the first year, they all kind of agreed to do, you know, to really buy in with the program. But as it moves on, patients are becoming a little more flexible. And, and I suppose we sent them a questionnaire and asked. And the first thing we can see is, is that 51% of them are eating more fatty food now. And equally, 40% of them are eating more takeaway food now. So we might need to start watching these people's cholesterol moving forward, because as you age, coronary artery disease is also an epiphenomenon in CF, and so we need to not drop the ball. What we can see is, is that they have less abdominal um, um, uh, discomfort. Their bowel motions are not as loose, and this is work championed by Kira Howlett and was presented at one of our meetings, and a more, uh, a, a, a more substantive version of this is at North American CF in, in a couple of months. So. Uh, um, it'll be there for people to see. Reduction in constipation, and here's the thing, self-reporting, they're, they're, they're using less enzymes when they're on this drug. So that's what people are doing. Whether they should be or not, they're doing it. And this is in a cohort that are responders. So this is important. Um, so why are they doing it? Maybe it's related to the pH being better. 
There's a Kiwi study that suggests in two to, six year, two to five year olds you get maybe a restoration in your pancreatic function with fecal elastase. But what we think is really interesting, and this is stuff from our group, is, um, you know this idea now that uh, you, know, you can blame your bowel for everything in life, you are what you eat, and it's your gut microbiome that determines who you are. We're seeing in our CF cohort over time the increase in the bacteroides, which is the good bug, and the decrease in the firmicutes, back to what a healthy, normal control is. So we're seeing a change in the gut microbiome. And so maybe this is, is, the, is the etiology behind this. Uh, Janet talked about diabetes. Well, people have said that they've seen a reversal of it. We didn't in our cohort. There's a single case report on liver disease. It's, ex and it's an exciting area of, of things. And some of these we might not see for five to ten years. I think the pediatricians would probably show us potentially a delay in CF-related diabetes, for instance. So what about the power of two? So I'm going to show you a slide that... Um, is not meant to shock anyone, so if you're a squeamish, this isn't real, this is makeup, okay? But could I have a catheter change uh, and CFTR modulation change cystic fibrosis? Well, it has for this girl. This is a girl who attends us, and this is what she looks like after she took out of a catheter. She went out, and her best friend, who's a makeup artist, did this for her for a Halloween party that she went to. And I suppose that's the point. She was liberated by the drug to be herself, and this is what she wants to be. So fair enough, if that's what you want to be. Um, um, but what's important is, is to go back through her, her history. She was 19 years old. She would again, reasonable lung function, 2010. The dreaded 2011 hit, and again, she crashed. And so suddenly she was in a situation where... Uh, sorry, uh, where she was FEV1 24% oxygen dependent continuously in hospital and what were we going to do for her? And again, we said, you know, we didn't, we only had the other gentleman was only coming through at the same time. We didn't know about end stage disease, but she was homozygote. So we said, you know, maybe you will do better. Maybe there'll be a dose issue here um, to deal with. Because in truth, if we go back, this is what most people in the world are like. They've got a gating and probably a delta 508, so they're like this. But she's like this. She's got it on both. So maybe there's a dosing response. Maybe treating both alleles will give you a benefit. And at that time, there was only one drug. And so uh, she went on the drug. And I'm delighted to say, and what you can see here is, is that her lung function went up and continue to go up. So she hasn't plateaued. She's risen by about 20% uh, uh, continuously. Her weight has gone up and continued to go up. Her sweat went down. It went down to about 30. I didn't believe it. I said, repeat it. If they repeated it, it was even further down. And her weight went up. And so the issue is, even, even with reduction, reducing her enzymes, should we be treating both mutations? I mean, is that where this is really going, that you start uh, with one, and not, once you get good at doing one, you do the second? Certainly in her, there's an argument that you have a different, a more sustained benefit if you modulate in that way. Okay, now, again, things don't always work out as we would plan them. And this is a success story of how good you can modulate and where we want to go. Um, but even when you go there, you can end up in a bad place. And, and this is a compliments of David Orenstein from Pittsburgh, and I, this, this tabulates the life of one of his patients, a girl with cystic fibrosis. And what you can see here, this is her lung function, and this is her BMI, and this side, the yellow is her BMI. And what you can actually see here is, is that her lung function is, you know, going along, taking a bit of a dip, going up, taking a bit of a dip. Um, her weight, on the other hand, has always been a challenge. So she's someone who's got cystic fibrosis, but she finds it hard to not be overweight. She goes on Ivacafter, and two things happen to her. First of all, her weight continues to go up, so she's dealing with obesity. And secondly, her adherence goes down, and she crashes, and things go wrong. So it doesn't always work. And, and it's why it's important that we have to monitor and explain to people. And so we wanted to look at adherence in our clinic, and, and Claire Hickey, who's our lead physiotherapist, again is looking at this data, and this is preliminary data from the Irish meeting earlier with the ultimate data coming out in Pittsburgh in a while, around 
uh, or not in Pittsburgh, in Arizona, around, you know, do we see a change in self-reporting what you do? And, and Janet has highlighted it to us already, how, how her world is changing more around exercise than airway clearance, for instance. And so we've looked at this. And self-reporting, the patients are saying they're not doing pulmozyme as much as they used to. They're not doing cola breathe or colamycin as much as they used to. They're not using tobramycin as much as they used to. And so this issue of getting away with it, as, as Janet uh, alluded to, is certainly in the mix in a group of responders. But when you look then at the number of airways clearance sessions, they seem to go down. But this is interesting. What we see is, is what's going up is quick airway clearance sessions. So you're able to do airway clearance quicker. And when we ask the patients, do they find it easier to expectorate, 80% do. So it might be that the dynamic is changing and the traditional approach has to change with it for some of these patients. Uh, equally, how many times do you partake in exercise? And you can see that after going on Ivacaftor and having your CFTR modulated, exercise goes up, as Janet ha highlighted in relation to Ivacaftor, Lumacaftor. And again, patients, a almost 80% felt it, it enhanced their ability to exercise. Um, and very interestingly for us, sports membership goes up. So, you know, the proof is in a change in pattern once your CFTR modulated. So maybe, again, we're going to have to at some point as we get into CFTR modulation address the uncomfortable question, but it is a question, okay, we showed that if you go on this drug with existing therapies, this is what's happening to you. Now, what do you do moving forward? And, you know, is there going to be some de-escalation or modification as you move forward? Because in essence, you are going potentially from being a CF bronchiectatic to a non-CF bronchiectatic. And this is an uncomfortable truth that we're going to have to face up to as we move into this era over the next 10 years. We can't just kind of say, stay on everything, because everyone will say, sure, I'll stay on everything, no problem. Our crowd said they'd stay on everything. And then you send them a questionnaire and someone isn't doing it because, because you know, you're an autonomous individual and you're entitled to that. So I think cases we can learn a lot. Now, it's important. There is far more important fish to fry than G551D. G551D is important because it showed we could do it and it showed how good we could do it. But it, at the end of the day, represents 4% of the CF population. So we need to think beyond that. And when we look beyond that, we can see there's, there's strong data in relation to R117H and in relation to homozygote delta 508s. And I want to sh talk about that data next. The first I want to talk about is R117H. And in relation to that, that's the conduct study. And that's been recently published. The conduct study has been recently published. And for all comers, it didn't reach its primary endpoint which was change in lung function for all comers. However, in adults, it did. So the adults had a lung function response, the, the, but the whole population diluted that response. However, everyone had a sweat chloride response of 24, and everyone had a CFQR response of 8. So these are meaningful responses. And on the back of that, we now know that this drug is, is, is available in the United States for all patients who have the R117H and is going through a process in Europe and in Australia. But if we look at the data, you can see that the sweat chloride met all, all its endpoints. But this is interesting. In relation to lung function, we saw the response in those over 18 and those with the 5T mutation. Um, so what does this mean? Again, for us, at the moment, it doesn't mean anything because we don't have the drug like you in Australia. But we got the drug for one of our patients. And I think it highlights where we need to think about CFTMR modulation and think beyond the, what the FDA want to get, or what someone wants to get a license, but rather what do, do we want so that a patient has a response, a meaningful clinical response. And this is a lady of ours who's poor lung function. For reasons that are complicated, she's been declined a lung transplant. Um, but we got her Ivacaftor based on a name patient uh, program 
and we put her on the drug. And what's important is, is that in the year before, or the six months before, she'd seven courses of IVs. Since going on Ivacaftor, she's had one course of IVs. And this is a manuscript which is impressed now with chest. And what it actually shows is, is for her, Ivacaftor with R117H doesn't improve her lung function. But it does improve her weight, it does improve her BMI, it does improve her sweat, her walk test, and all her domains of well-being. So it's working. It stopped her disease. And people talk about perfinidone being an amazing drug in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis because it slows the progression of a, con of a continuous disease. Cystic fibrosis is a continuous disease associated with pulmonary decline. If you can stop pulmonary decline or you can stop exacerbation, that is a huge opportunity for an individual. And I suppose this lady highlights that and highlights looking at parameters beyond simply what's the FEV1 and what's the sweat. Because in truth, there are only two things. And in essence, does she really care what her lung function is? She's far more interested as an individual to care what she can do. So this is her CT scan. And again, we think that CT is, is going to be part of looking at this. You can see here her mucus plugging uh, has gone down. And you can see that at six months, these effects are sustained. So she's enhanced mucociliary clearance without an improvement in her lung function. You can also see she, she's no left lung, uh, um, which, uh, which uh, is one of the reasons she's a tricky uh, transplant case. OK, what about? Delta 508, the holy grail, homozygote Delta 508. This is, the, this is the one we really want to tackle. And I think it's important that we, that we think about three trials, transport, traffic, and progress. And I think it's important that the data I'm going to show you, that we recognize one thing, which is that the reason this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine is because it has shown that you can revert a declining lung function. You can improve lung function in people with homozygote delta 508. That was shown, and that is important um, uh, to begin with. And progress uh, is sort of complements it. And so this data, championed by Claire Wainwright, one of your own, uh, for the New England paper, and uh, championed by Stuart Elburn, who's one of ours, uh, um, uh, as it were, uh, in, at the European CF when he presented some of the progress uh, data. And basically, what this study showed was it showed uh, sort of an absolute improvement in lung function of about 3%. So this is not G551D. There's no question we're not seeing that much of a lift, but we're seeing a lift in lung function. We're seeing a reversal in decline. So if you can stop something and reverse it, that's a real positive. And you know, the, the mean absolute uh, was anything from two to six and the relative four to six. When we look at this, um, and we look at this subgroup analysis, what we can see is, is that the drug independent of the individual's background seems to be that you see, you see a response, albeit uh, that it isn't the response we saw with Ivacaftor and G551D. What we did see, and what is really important for me as a clinician, and unfortunately for Janet's husband Dave, as an individual, he hasn't seen this, is as we've seen a reduction in exacerbation rate. And if you look at it here, events leading to hospitalization, reductions of you know, anything from 39 to 61% or 45 to 56% needing IV antibiotics. And if we think back to the D.B. Sanders paper, which says that every time you exacerbate, you have a 25% chance of not going back to your pre-exacerbation baseline. If you can decrease exacerbations, you can really change the natural history of a disease. So this is an important drug. Uh, and we shouldn't underestimate that. Equally, what progress has shown is, is that the, the effects are sustained out to 48 weeks in relation to this preservation um, of, 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 of 3 to 5 percent. And again, if we look at the BMI, the BMI goes up um, at 24 weeks. It goes up by about a quarter of what went up at 48 weeks in, in, in Strive. At, for, at 48 weeks, it's about half of what you saw in Strive, improvement in BMI. So there is a weight gain, again, reversing a condition, albeit not as, as strong. Uh, and, uh, and similarly, I think the CFQR doesn't show the same responses uh, um, 
you know, because I think the time points may, may take longer potentially to see it. Uh, and indeed, I think Dave highlighted that uh, uh, very well, that he, as an individual, he didn't have a response. Uh, and again, this just shows it in another way. Interesting is some patients report a dystia and, a, and an early chest tightness. And so that's an important finding, and it's a particularly important finding if you've got more severe disease, because you just want to be careful in using this drug on people like that. Now, my understanding is, is that they've done an analysis of that data, and it's safe, but I think we need to be aware of people with worse lung function going into this drug. There might be a, a, a bad week, uh, as it were, uh, at the start that was seen that sort of self-limited. Okay, so, so CFTR modulation. We've, we've talked about how good it can be. We talked about how we've, you know, the holy grail has been achieved. We have created something that does target Delta 508 positively. Uh, obviously, we'd like it to, to over time, become uh, an even greater response. But this does uh, reverse the disease, and that's an important uh, point. What about everything else? So in relation to the read-through agents, there's a drug called atiluron, and these represent about 10% of mutations. And there was a study on that. And that was a negative study. It didn't work. But then they did a subgroup analysis. And they found that those who weren't taking tobramycin had a response. However, the response was more a stabilization in lung function in those on the drug and a deterioration in those on placebo. So is it a real finding or not? The jury is out. So I think at this point, we need more data on these read-through agents before we can say they're truly CFTR modulators. What about gene therapy? In relation to gene therapy, Eric Alton's group have recently, again, a very important paper because they've shown that you can do gene therapy in cystic fibrosis. However, as they allude to themselves, they use the word uh, um, basically significant, albeit modest, treatment effect. Because again, what they saw in the gene therapy group was a preservation in lung function and a decline in placebo. And so again, you know, more work needs to be done before we can truly regard these as clinically CFTR modulators. However, their secondary endpoints were met, and so whether over a longer time course, you might see some of these benefits, we don't know yet. Okay, so we're almost there. See, and this is where we went to, up to 2015. So where are we in 2015? Well, there is the next drug. There's VX661. And I know that that's going into trial in Delta 508. And I think it offers huge promise to, to bring us to the next step. Equally, there's a product called N, N6022, which is also uh, very much making its way uh, in this whole uh, homozygote Delta 508 group. I think we need to think about biomarkers of treatment response and sweat testing. You know, it's, it's, it's nice and everything, but it doesn't correlate with response. So how are we going to work out if people truly respond? And again, this goes back to Jeanette's comment, you know, for Dave, and she, she responded, he didn't. Is there any other way that we can do this? And in relation to that, how can we CFTR modulate for all? Because with respect to Novartis or Vertex or anyone else who wants to get into this game, they're not going to do studies for every single mutation because it's just not financially viable. That's just a fact. And so in reality, what we can say if we look at this is we can see that in green here, we've got almost 60% of them covered at the moment in the trials. But there's all sort of N equals to one studies, rare mutations. And how are we going to work out for these people, whether we modulate or not? And so in relation to that, it's funny how CF was originally a GI disease, became a pulmonary disease. But you know this kind of idea, I think Sheik had the song, going back to my roots. We're going back to the gut again for the answer. Because I think a really exciting development is this thing called intestinal organoids. And to summarize, and this is really, this is the classic kind of physician's approach to, to science. So get a physician like me to talk about nature medicine papers, it's heresy. I just dumb it all down, but that's because it's the only way I can understand it. And the bottom line here is, is you can take a rectal biopsy, and from a rectal biopsy, you can extrapolate epithelial cells. And you can make these into things called organoids that swell. And in essence, organoids to a clinician are ex vivo cultured 3D epithelial structures. They're mini-me. 
They are me in a dish. And what you can do with that is you can take a drug called foral skin, and if you've got CFTR, this organoid will swell. They've shown this. It's unique to the, to the product. So if you take someone who's got uh, uh, CFTR and you give them foral skin, it swells. Okay? If you don't have CFTR or your CFTR doesn't work, it doesn't swell. So mini-me will swell if your CFTR is working and won't swell if your CFTR isn't working. And in extremely elegant work done by Decker in Nature, what you can see here is this is a control, this is a healthy individual, this is a CF patient, no swelling. But when you add in the different drugs, there's swelling in situations where there's potentiation or correction, and there isn't when you knock it out. So this is a whole future way for the rarer mutations and also to understand the lack of responders uh, uh, and where we're going. And I think this is something that, that is really cutting edge and, and something uh, very important. So to conclude, it, CFTR modulation, it's exciting times. It really is exciting times because in essence, we have addressed all of these at different levels. It's expensive times. And again, that's the elephant in the room. We all know it. Money is an issue. However, if we look at personalized medicine and we look at the stuff that's being written around this, there are so many cheap drugs out there that don't work for people, uh, and yet you can get them. And so the argument here is, is how we, as a collective community, and that's clinicians, healthcare teams, patients, advocacy groups, and industry work to think outside the box for these individual markers of response that don't get something approved by the FDA, but actually get something into a clinic because there's a meaningful marker for my patients that say we can use this drug. So finally, I'd just like to acknowledge I have a great life because I work with all these brilliant people. Uh, uh, in my own groups, particularly Nicola Ronan deserves a mention, Joe Eustace and the CF nurses who are just fantastic and our collaborators beyond and just in relation to beyond, we're very proud of a thing called CF Matters. Google us um, at some point and you might find it interesting and thank you for your attention. <laughs>